folks, we are so lucky. We have the one and only uneducated economist. How are you doing, Simon? Doing awesome, man. Thank you for inviting me on today. Oh, I appreciate it. I love talking with you. You give me great insights all the time. We are going to do a second video about lumber, but video number one, I want to talk about George Gammon, someone you know personally. Uh, you've been invited yeah. to speak at his events. You communicate with him regularly. Uh, he just put out a video talking about a 50% housing crash in prices on a real versus nominal basis, which is a subtle tweak. Uh, but you had a chance to watch it. I'd like to get your early reaction, what you thought of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. George is a great guy. George has really done a lot for me and my channel. He, I mean, I cannot thank him enough. Um, especially the invites to go and speak down at the uh, rebel capitalist for the conference. I mean, that was really something that just kind of changed my life really. Cause it was like an event that is something way beyond anything I ever thought I would do. Um, but yeah, he invited me down to speak about my insights into the lumber industry. Um, I watched his recent video that he was talking about as far as the 50% drop in housing, housing prices. And, um, Really, the beginning of the video is so good. I mean, he did yeah. such a great job of breaking down um, the inflation scenario and the Fed's reaction to it all. It, he does these whiteboard videos that are just like, they're really, really good. Um, and he nails it. He absolutely nails every aspect from the Federal Reserve's position, their monetary policy, the complications, you know, comparing like the CPI to, you know, the Fed funds rates and, you know, all this stuff, like he really breaks it down well. The only the only thing that I have to push back against this scenario that he talks about is that he doesn't mention anything from the supply side, not a single thing. Right. Yeah. And that's really like you have a supply. He talks completely about the demand side, which he nails. I mean, absolutely nails it perfectly. But if you Looking at the prices from a supply versus demand, and you only take on the demand side, thinking that the supply is a constant, right. then it, it fails. It fails to to oh, come right. up with the with the with the with the proper you know answer on it. And yeah. and I'm not saying like George is inaccurate for the rest of the video and all the predictions mm -hmm. and everything that comes with it. Is this that from the supply side of things? Because that's really where I look at from a lot of things right. is the distribution network, the supply side of things. There is huge disruptions that are still taking place within that. And to me, like if you avoid including that within your predictions, then you're going to miss, you're probably going to end up missing the mark. Um, yeah. At least that's, that's, that's my opinion on it. But as far as understanding the demand side of things, I, I mean, he, he, I mean, you cannot get any more accurate than what he was describing it as. So. I am so glad you looked at it. I've watched the video a couple of times now as a lot of people ask me to react to it. And I have to tell you right now, this is why I love talking to you. I completely miss that. Yeah. Completely yeah, miss well, everybody. That. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. The supply side is missing. And that the really subtle thing of this is that's why you and I've talked in the past about the crash bros, just under a generic umbrella. They too miss the supply side. All of them have held constant at 6 million transactions, which we had for a decade. What they have missed is now we're going to do 4 million and likely do a little less than 4 million the next several years. So the constant assumption at 6 million doesn't hold water, right? If you were going to tell me somehow, some way supply would go up and we would do 6 million transactions, I'd go, Simon, prices are coming down. But we're not doing six, we're doing four. We might even do 3.8 or 3.7. That's a very different demand and supply equation. You are so right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, I, I have a tendency to kind of just shrink these things down to a very simple form for me. I do retail sales, right? I work at a lumber yard. I do retail sales. I literally stand at a counter and ring up two by fours for customers. I mean, that's literally my job. I do a lot of special orders for the store. So that's kind of like what my position there is, is if somebody needs like, you know, special order doors or windows or needs specialty items tracked down, I'm the guy who goes and does all that stuff, right? There's other guys who do like the blueprint reading and the takeoffs and the house packages and stuff like that. I have done that in, in my past. I've done that kind of position, but I found that the position that I have taken now is the one that is best for me. Like it's less stressful. I make a lot of money doing it. It's like, you know, it's also pretty difficult to, to do that, um, that kind of thing, not to d dive into my, my personal, but anyway, um, when I, when I look at like the supply side of stuff, Right. I have a tendency to shrink it down to this a small item. Right. 
Like I looked at the Fernco fittings when it came to the bullwhip effect, right? And how, you know, misunderstandings of how much demand there is for a particular item gets obscured as it goes through the market. Like the wholesalers, the retailers, the distributor, the sh- distributors, the manufacturers, they all see like these odd amount of orders and gaps in in production and stuff like that that are happening. And so nobody knows exactly how much they they really need. And so to truly understand this, like working from a retail position, I saw people panic buying, right? Yeah. So there was this little tiny plumbing fitting that held up jobs, right? It can, it's just a rubber fern coat fitting. It connects two different odd sized pieces of pipe. And it's very important. It's like a $10 item, right? But it holds up like these mm-hmm. excavators if they're putting in like a, or, you know, these septic systems or something and they need to join these pipes. This one $10 part, prevents them from completing their job, right? So Mm. all of a sudden here comes the parts they are coming back in because, you know, we had this gap in manufacturing and distribution and COVID and all that other stuff. So these parts start to come in. Well, the guys who were missing these things and holding up their job, they bought them all. I said, Hey man, you know, I can get more of these things. Don't, don't stress it. And they're like, Oh no, we were out. We not happening again, (laughs) never again. Right. So they (laughs) buy all of them. Well, the next guy comes in, he doesn't have them. He sees that the, the shelf gets full. He buys all of them too. They only need one, but they're buying all of them. Right. Mm. So now the computer algorithms, the the distribution network, they don't (laughs) see that this is panic buying taking place. Right. right? All of a sudden they're just seeing this overwhelming consumer demand. Right. Oh, my God. We've got the best thing in the world. Let's make more. That's exactly right. So they start pumping out a lot of these things. And all of a sudden my shelf went from carrying typically two or three of these things. So now I have eight and they don't sell. Right? Yeah, you're right. You know, and so the, this is the bullwhip effect, right? Yeah. And this is yeah. that, that truly that is happens. awesome. Yeah. And, and this is how come like we saw a lot of issues that were taking place within the lumber industry. That was like, that was one of the things, I mean, I know we're going to talk about lumber a little bit, but it was, it was where I noticed it first. I was just like, man, this is a complete inventory breakdown followed by a mass stimulus package that wiped out inventory. This is not the money printer go burr that's causing these prices to go up. This is an inventory breakdown, right? Yeah. Now, and then human psychology told, on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. And then everybody, well, you know, you have to think there was an inventory depletion taking place back in 2019 due to, you know, environmental conditions and stuff like that. We don't need to go into that part right now. But there was an inventory depletion taking place. And then COVID hit even more inventory depletion because the mills were shut down right everybody was handed a stimulus package and they went down to the lumber yard and started building fences and decks and you know getting ready for to be locked down at, at their place and have a better environment to be in right so they were improving their garages or you know adding additions or doing whatever so it wiped out the remaining inventory that was out there Lumber is very heavy and bulky. It's difficult to get it back through the system again, right? You got to cut the trees, mill it up, put it on rails, put it on trucks, have forklifts, have everything to to move all this stuff all over the place. And distributing that lumber back through the system in an efficient manner was very difficult to get back into into production again. Once it did, the lumber flows right through the system, Mm -hmm. no problem, from beginning to end, and the prices crash. Boom, down to 400 per thousand. All the mills shut down again, and then inventory mm-hmm. depletion starts to take place, and this is the bullwhip effect, right? This is yeah. how how it happens. It doesn't have anything really to do with the money printing, although that has a huge impact into everything. The distribution network, the inventory levels, the manufacturing of it, all this stuff was completely distorted. And when you have a distortion imbalance of supply and demand, and you have an inelastic demand coming from the home builders, prices could really go through the roof. And that's exactly what happened. It's not difficult for me to understand this stuff. It Mm -hmm. is difficult to understand it if you are only looking at it from the Federal Reserve money printing monetary policy, because you will see exactly how it happened if you look yep. it from that direction money printer go burr prices went up what else do you need to know all right and so yeah. if you just just avoid the whole supply side of things you will get your answers from the monetary policies yep. why the why the why the lumber went up but if you include the supply side to it it's all of a sudden you realize oh man there's a much bigger picture and a much clearer picture of what happened yeah, I love it. I mean, again, I have an econ degree. Supply demand is two sides. We often talk about one or the other and miss that. So again, I freely admit I've watched the video several times. I've talked about supply and I completely miss that. So uh, thank you for that. That was very, yeah. very eye-opening. Yeah, I want to go back you know, to George and give him some of okay. his flowers because I think there's a couple of things in that video 
that he talked about that I was really happy with. Number yeah. one is, and I'm curious if you agree or disagree, uh, is I believe Jerome Powell is playing for legacy. Right yeah. now, his legacy is the transitory guy. And that's going to be embarrassing for his grandchildren. I believe Jerome Powell is looking at this like his grandkids. And maybe his grandkids aren't even born yet. He wants to go down in the books much more like Paul Volcker than Arthur Burns. And I think that was one of the first points of G George's three points. And I agree with it. I think this is legacy. And what that means is, is he's going to go farther than people want. He's probably going to go farther than he needs to. And, you know, he's very quickly going to become the hate, most hated person in America, especially if he raises rates next week, which I think he does. I think he goes up another quarter. So, yeah, I think this is legacy for Jerome Powell. Do you see it that way? No. Awesome. Tell me why not. Because I don't think Jerome Powell has any power. Okay. All right. And he he's a voice for the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee. Jerome Powell doesn't make decisions on interest rates. Right. He's not the one who's out there saying, like, I feel as me personally going to make this decision for everybody out there. It doesn't work like that. There's 11 other people who are going to be voting on this. And most people don't even have any idea on who they are. Like, I mean, I went and looked up their names. And right now I could probably guess maybe four or five of them right? right i mean i went and like researched you know who they were looked at their wikipedia page or whatever yeah. they're all just regular you know ac you know yeah, academics like anybody yeah. else they're nobody special right i mean that's and it's funny about it is because when you look at their names i mean there's a couple of them that you would recognize you know michelle bowman uh who else is in there uh i think john williams Neil Kashkari. Yeah, Neil Kashkari. I mean, there's a few people in there that you see them constantly in the news. Yeah, so you see CNBC favorites. Yeah. 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 Other ones, you never, ever, ever even hear of them. You have no idea who these people are, or how they vote, or what they're thinking, right? Mm. Now, Jerome Powell, he is just the voice for the op for the Federal Open Market Committee. That's it. He is basically speaking on their behalf. So yep. when people say he's trying to, to be the Paul Volcker, he can't do that. Even if he wanted to be, he can't do that without the FOMC voting on it. Right. Okay. You know, so no, like, I mean, bl shifting blame to Jerome Powell is like putting it on the Easter bunny. All right. Oh, I mean, it's okay. like, I'm serious. It's like, there, there's no point in looking at Jerome Powell. I mean, you can look at it. I mean, you can look at the vote that he might do, but then you also have to think about the other votes that everybody else is going to be doing sure. as well, because that's going to be the decision that is made, not okay. what Jerome Powell thinks, right? Uh, all right. So that, that's I like why it. I don't like. I exclude all that that stuff out of there. It doesn't. That doesn't mean anything to me as far as Jerome okay. Powell. He's going to be the evil guy. He's trying to do this. He's trying to get the legacy. All that. Other. No, that's not the way. Perfect. Even if he wanted it, he has to have the FOMC vote for that. So perfect. Um, all right, number number two. Yeah. I thought was interesting. Uh, I think, and I've said this before on my channel, it'll be interesting if you disagree or agree again. I think the, the Fed has two tools. One is this meeting every six weeks where they raise or lower interest rates. Yep. And two is their voice, right? They have a microphone. They have yep. a powerful position and people put microphones in front of them. So they have their voice, whether it's Neil Kaskari or Mary, wherever in San Francisco, uh, their voice carries weight and they use it. Absolutely. Yeah. And okay. see, now I coined this term a long time ago when I first started my channel. Okay. It's called it? credible threats. Ah, I like that. I had not heard yeah, that. I'm it's sorry. called credible threats. And now, really, this is not this is not new. This is something. See, I got this idea from a Ben Bernanke speech that was given back in 2001. All right. Mm, now, okay. Ben Bernanke back in 2001 gave a speech. I can't remember the exact title of it. It's something about deflation and deflation and preventing it from ever occurring here. OK, because okay. they knew they knew back in the day, back in 2001, before any of this crap had gone down. I mean, we're talking 20 something years ago. Right. Right. They knew that they were going to be running into the lower bound of zero. Right. They knew that Fed funds rate would eventually hit zero and that the adjustment of Fed funds rate would no longer stimulate the economy. They knew it back then. And Ben Bernanke says, but that's OK. We have other tools that we can use. And now he didn't use the term credible threats. I came up with that, right? Like but now he used a story to try and describe what a credible threat would look like as far as being able to use it as a useful tool and monetary policy. He related it down to a little story that he had told about a guy who invents a gold machine, right? Mm -hmm. And with this gold machine, he can produce as much gold at will with very little power or energy, very little resource going into it. 
right? The moment that the information gets out to the market that this guy has this machine, the price of gold on the market would dump immediately out there just off of the mere idea that this guy has this machine before he even produces a single ounce mm -hmm. of gold or even has the machine to do it. Just the credible threat alone would be enough to change the market's perception on it. Right. That right there is the main tool coming from the Federal Reserve. If you listen to the Federal Reserve on the mainstream media, you are getting credible threats. Like it. Go and yes. read their speeches. Their speeches yeah. are very telling of what they plan on doing. Right. So on their purpose. speeches are one yes. thing. And the, and the mainstream media is their credible threats in which that they're using for their monetary policies to guide markets. I love that. I love that credible right. threat. I See, will, this uh... is another one that, like, you know, they, I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I love George Gammon. I love Peter Schiff. These guys are my like, they're my heroes, right? But I came up with that credible threat theory when I started my channel. And, you know, here Peter Schiff is getting open mouth uh, yeah. committee or whatever. And I'm like, open mouth operations. And I'm thinking, you know, guys, this is credible threats that I coined yeah. years ago. You know? Yeah, I'm going to start using credible threat and I will give you credit. I will give Thank you credit. Thank you. I appreciate it. And awesome. I got it from Ben Bernanke's speech from 2001 saying that this is the monetary policy tools that they would be using today. I think it's amazing. Now, I'm going to guess, just a wild ass guess, you yeah. researched and found that speech. It wasn't like you stumbled. I mean, you didn't find it in 2020 or 2001. No, sorry. No, no. I've had the speech for a while. Now, here's the thing about my channel, my Michael, man, here's here's the thing. I'm not that smart. Right. I'm really not that smart. I'm I'm a, I, I'm good at like, you know, problem solving things. You know, I kind of put these pieces together and all this other stuff. My viewers are the smartest people in the world. All right. Wow. And yeah. they send me this stuff. They're like, dude, check out this speech. Here, check this thing out. Whatever. Awesome. Like, I, I mean, like the research, it's a symbiotic thing that I got going on with my channel. Like, you know, I That's put out awesome. some stuff and people are like, hey, it sounds like, uh, you know, whatever, the uh, bullwhip effect. Yeah. And I'm reading the comments. I'm like, bullwhip effect. Yeah, I remember that. What is that? I go research bullwhip. That's exactly what's happening here. Yeah. Right? So it was like my fans were the ones I was describing what I was seeing. It was my fans who said, Hey, yeah. what you're describing is this. And I go and research that. And then I'm like, yeah, you're right. That is this, you know? And so like between so the awesome. two of us, we figured it out. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. Your, your fans are amazing. I obviously watch your videos and, and look at the comments a lot. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, a couple more things about the George Gammon video. I wanted yeah. to ask about right near the end, he kind of nonchalantly, at least in my opinion, talks about having 10% inflation for five years, like it's a foregone conclusion. Yeah, I um, don't see that as very I, likely. Yeah. And that's, and that's the, that's the, 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 the kicker to his 50% drop is that you have this continuous inflation that doesn't end. Um, I, I don't see that. I don't, yeah. I don't see that. I don't see that being the scenario taking place. Now I'm not saying it doesn't, if it, I mean, if it does play out, where we have this inflation scenario that doesn't end and it keeps going, then I think George is absolutely 100% right. Yeah. And mathematically he's correct. I, if that happens. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the idea of what he is, is putting out there is, is, is correct. If the theory of inflation doesn't end, yep. I, I, I believe that it will end. I mean, and I think it's going to end very quickly and very, you know, very shockingly to a lot of people. Um, in the way that, in the way that I see it, it's not like necessarily that inflation is going to end and everything kind of goes back to the way it was. Like that's that's not what's what I see happening. What I see happening is that the Federal Reserve has positioned themselves in a way that they are not taking on the idea that the supply chain is going to come and help them. Like they they even said it back back when they started to raise the interest rates, that they are going to help look for help from the supply side of things. I mean, they straight up said it. And I'm like, why Why in the world would the supply side jump on board with the killing of the demand? Like, to me, you know, the way I saw it, it was just like, okay, so we had this, you know, huge imbalance, right? The supply versus demand imbalance. Supply fell, demand shot up with the stimulus packages. So now we have this huge supply demand imbalance. And if you have that, you're going to have prices increasing no matter what, right? So now what ended up happening is, is that they're trying to bring the demand down in line with the supply, right? So they want to mm -hmm. balance this out. The only problem is, is that they were hoping to get help from the supply side, meaning that supply would want to try and manufacture, distribute, do all the other things that would, you know, 
typically go on in a normal economy, but this isn't a normal economy. They're hurting the demand. So why would supply try to manufacture, distribute, and do all that other stuff into a killing of the demand, their actual customer? Mm -hmm. So I said it back then. It wasn't going to work. What you're going to find is that the supply and the demand are both going to fall together and the inflation won't go away right until it reaches a bottom once it reaches that bottom then they'll balance out and then you'll have growth and the dropping of interest rates and everything else that starts to take off from there but until it reaches that equilibrium you're going to have the continuation coming from the federal reserve exactly like we see it you know higher interest rates for longer until that balance starts to take place right. and who knows how long that's going to happen and then when you think about it when it does start to turn around the supply is going to be very limited out there. There's exactly. not going to be a lot of it, right? And so the manufacturing, the distribution, all that other stuff, there's going to be so much room for growth. And that's really what they were looking for was growth. Exactly. They said that that was the problem. I mean, John Williams was talking about that back in 2018 in his speech mm. of um, monetary policy for a low neutral interest rate world. They said that growth had fallen so dramatically around the world. And they had no idea on how it was that they were going to try and get this growth back. Well, guess what? When you take mm -hmm. supply and demand down to the very bare minimum, now you got all kinds of room for growth, right? That's awesome. This is actually, this is actually Austrian economics at play. They're trying to burn out all the dead undergrowth, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to kill off the zombie corporations. They're trying to get rid of the bad debt that's out there. Once you get rid of all this bad debt, these bad zombie corporations, all this even zombie people for the most part who are debt saturated and can't really, you know, advance themselves because they have, you know, <clears throat> taken on so much debt. Once you wipe all this stuff out of there, then it's the green shoots that can grow, yep. right? All of a sudden you have all this room for expansion. Yeah. You have the zombie corporations who are taking the best resources and employment for uselessness because they're mm -hmm. not a viable company. And it's going to turn around and go back into viable companies and we'll have something that can grow from that. So it's really like the Federal Reserve is actually using like the free market to fix all this crap, right? I mean, ah, it doesn't I seem like it. like it because there's so much manipulation in there. But if you allow the free market to kind of work its way in there and destroy some things, because that's really what needs to happen is like, you know, you need some people to. to yeah, you need, need some pain. Fail. You need some you know? pain. You need yeah. some pain. Right? And yeah. this is. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So the, the closing thought on George Gammon's video, uh, at least in my opinion, was. He didn't close with, if you believe this, this is what you should do. So again, I'll set it up. And again, I don't, we've already said, I don't see five years of 10% inflation, but again, if you really see five years of 10% inflation, you should go buy a home today. You should go buy a rental home today. You're going to borrow three points or so, maybe four points under inflation. You're going to have fixed rate debt. Over the next five years, wages are going to go up because a big component of inflation is wages. Housing is 42% of CPI. So rents are going to go up about 50% in five years. You should buy a home and let the cash flow take care of you. Because again, in an environment where inflation is running rampant, debt holders win. Asset holders win. And I think George missed the point of, if you believe me, and then there's this real crash of 50%, you should go buy a home because your debt collapses as well. I don't, I don't think he closed with that. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's a, that's it, that kind of strategy is, is, I don't know. To me, that's like a, it's a very nervous strategy because you're basically basing your outcome on an external event to take place. And oh, that's, I, I totally that, agree. That, I'm just saying that, if, yeah. if you believed again, George said it like, it's like if you think if you if I believed we were going to have 10 percent inflation for five years, which I don't. But if I did. I would go borrow money at six or seven percent. Yeah. Fixed rate, no variable. But, you know, there was yeah, no I mean, if then. It, 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 absolutely. I mean, that's that's just the thing. Like, I don't. Because I don't see inflation lasting forever, like, or f for years to come like that. I mean, I, I, then again, you know, I mean, people will say you didn't see inflation lasting this long, which I really didn't. Like, I mean, I thought, you know, we would start seeing inflation coming down quicker than this. I didn't, I know the interest rates aren't going to come down. I know, like, as far as the Fed funds rate, I knew those things were going to stay elevated for a significant amount of time. I, but I yeah, I mean, no I, cut this year. No cut. What do you think? No cut? Oh, no. We were not going to see a cut for a significant amount of time. I mean, it's going to, People are going to be like, "What is the Fed doing? Like, why are they, <laughs> the like, why are they still not moving?" Right, yeah. and that's you know, and that's really, you know, because 
you know, I mean, they they ultimately said it. They're going for the average inflation rate over time, right? And so when I when I said it like a while ago, I said they're going to keep interest rates low, right? They're going to keep inflation running extra hot, extra long for an extended period of time. I said that. I said it over and over and over again, right? Because they were trying to make up for the fact that they had missed the 2% inflation target over the last 10 years. So they're trying to get inflation, average inflation up, right? This 2% average inflation over time, whatever the hell that means. And, I, and by consequence of that, what you'll end up having to do is you'll have to keep interest rates elevated for a significant amount of time, even after the inflation comes down because of the average inflation rate over time that they are shooting for. So it ends up putting the Federal Reserve doing exactly opposite of what people are thinking that they should be doing in order to achieve the average inflation rate over time. And this is this is really where I think a lot of the economists are very confused by the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve used to shoot for a 2% target, where right. if the inflation rate was over 2%, they would adjust monetary policy to achieve the 2% target. If it was under it, they would do it again to achieve the 2% target. Now, they're not going for the 2% target. They're going for a 2% target average rate over time. And Correct. so that's very difficult to understand. Different game. Because yeah. Right, because now they're going to keep interest rates elevated even as the inflation comes down so they can get the average inflation rate, whatever the hell that is, over time to, to land at that 2%. So it's it's really what we're going to end up finding is the Federal Reserve behaving exactly opposite of what we would typically anticipate them doing so that they can achieve their average inflation rate over time instead of the target. This is going to be so much fun to unravel. Simon, you have an amazing channel called The Uneducated Economist. Uh, obviously, people should follow that. You put out great videos. What else uh, would you want to tell people? You know, um, I'm on YouTube every day. I try to put YouTube videos out there. I am on the other social medias, but really, I'm just active on YouTube. Um, you know, my channel is not really trying to figure out where it is that you need to invest or anything like that, but really try to help people understand what it is that's taking place in the economy so that we can make the best decisions for ourselves. You know, a lot of times when we listen to these economists out there, we are listening to somebody who is not looking at it from a point of view, like a lot of us in the working class, you know, driving 99 Toyota Corollas and stuff, you know, we have a much different look and in outlook on, on the economy and our goals and our needs are very different from a lot of the people who are talking economics from the investment point of view. So that's really what the channel is all about is becoming economically aware. I love it. You do a great job. You have an ability to take complex issues and really put the puzzle pieces together. So the average person can understand. I have a degree, an advanced degree, been doing this a long time and you helped me a lot. And you have some eye opening things like you did at the beginning of the video that I just missed. So keep it up. Keep doing what you're doing, Simon. We all appreciate you. Thank you.